for inviting me to speak. Um, I haven't uh, requested to present myself, but I can do it. Uh, I'm a librarian by training. I finished the library school in Oslo, Norway, in 1999. Then I did um, uh, something called, or I got a title, Master of Documentation, which I think is quite cool, uh, in 2005, it's a master's degree. And I worked as a librarian at uh, something called Bode University College, uh, which is now a university. It was a university college then, from about 2000 to 2009, uh, with a couple of small breaks. And then, in the beginning of June of 2009, I quit my job and I started my own company, which I call the Video Tech, for some reason. And what I do is, uh, what was mentioned earlier today, I sell services related to open source software for libraries. So I don't sell software, I don't sell uh, licenses, but I sell uh, my time and I sell my knowledge. At least I try to do that. I have survived for more than two years now. <laughs> I think I will survive next year. Um, but it's sort of um, making, it up, making it up as I go along. Uh, I've been working on different projects that are more or less related to free software uh, to make ends meet, really. So that's me. Um, and I've been asked to talk about open source software in Norwegian libraries something like that. Um, um, the thing with open source versus free software was mentioned earlier today and I'm not going to discuss that either but I'm going to talk about free Libre open source software. So I'm just I'm trying to embrace everything basically. So my plan is to talk about uh, free Libre open source software being created in Norwegian libraries and then I'll go on to talk about uh, pre-existing FLOSS software uh, being used in Norwegian libraries then I'm going to talk about uh, upstream if that doesn't ring any bells just wait and see I'm going to talk a very little bit about open data since that's been mentioned by several people today and then maybe I'll try to draw some conclusions that might just be an excuse for me going on about some of my uh, uh, fixed ideas related to free software. We'll see. So, point one, uh, first off, creating free Libre open source software. I'll just say the loss for the duration of the, what I want to say, that's easier. So what I'm going to do is uh, show you uh, some projects. Um, I'll, I have a screenshot of them, uh, um, and it'll be all over the place. Uh, you'll be confused at the end, I think. Um, so it's the aim is to give you some kind of idea of what is happening, and I have put a lot of links in my presentations, so you can. And I'll put the uh, presentations on uh, SlideShare, and uh, you might want to email the address of the people afterwards. So if something uh, looks interesting, you will be able to go back to my presentation and explore the links to find the source code and read more about the projects and look at how they work. So um, and the order here is uh, random, it's just the way it happened. The first one is called Reactor. That's uh, a really interesting project. It's kind of website slash social network for user generated content so it's uh, photographs videos poems all kinds of text so it's flickr meets youtube meets facebook etc um, that kind of sounds uh, why would we want to do that we have flickr and we have youtube and we have facebook the interesting thing is that this id came up in something like 2003 which was really before any of these websites got really big. So if they had just got the money and done it in six months, they would have been way ahead of their time. Uh, but sadly, that's not how things worked. They had to apply for the money and 
find the company to do these things for them and things to time. So uh, today it looks like a project that is sort of behind its time. But really it was in front of, uh, it was ahead of its time, in its time. Uh, the project was based at the Oslo Public Library. That's the biggest public library in Norway. And we'll meet them several times during the presentation. Uh, they got some funding from ABM Utvikling, which is, uh, was the Norwegian state authority for libraries, museums and archives. Archives, libraries and museums. Um, which does not exist any longer which I think is kind of sad. Uh, they took the library stuff out and gave that to the National Library and we still, we're waiting to see how that uh, turns out. The actual coding was done by a company called Red Pill Linpro, so they hired them to do the job. Um, the website is still active and it's used uh, on a daily basis. It's available at minreaktor.no. And it's a place where you can register and you can upload your photos and videos and talks and everything. And you can comment on what others have done and uh, give ratings, I think, and stuff like that. Um, yeah, the prototype started around 2003. And version 2 was developed 2008-2009. Uh, and again, these are links and just for the geeks in the audience. Are there any geeks? Hackers? No, okay. They're upstairs working. Yeah. <laughs> Last time is for the geeks that are cheap. So that's one pro uh, project. Another project is Sublima. That's a tool for building subject portals, uh, maintaining lists of uh, internet resources, uh, sort of cataloging the web. Um, that's been done several times over. I think what's interesting maybe about this one is that it uses RDF, semantic web technologies, in the background. Um, again, this was uh, initiated and administered by Oslo Public Library with funding from ABM. And they used a company called Computas uh, to do the work. And it was Computas who suggested that they would, should use RDF because, uh, and again, they were quite early doing that. Uh, today everyone is talking about semantic web, but this was a year or two ago, and they just thought it would be a way to solve the problem at hand. Um, and that's been really good because it's given uh, some of the key people at Oslo Public Library real deep insight into RDF and semantic web which we have uh, built on in later projects. Um, this was more or less initiated by the ABM Entwickling, I think. So um, uh, they wanted to use it to build different kinds of subject portals. This is the subject portal which is maintained by the Oslo Public Library. It's called Detector. Um, and it's got 5,500 resources. 2,400 subjects. That does sound like a lot of subjects for not that many more resources, I think. But anyway. And it's maintained actually actively by staff at the Oslo Public Library. Um, the same uh, software has been used to create uh, something called SMEAL, which is something to do with uh, medical information for laymen, ordinary people. Um, so that uh, they collect uh, links to medical information uh, and use this tool to organize it. Uh, you can read more about it at the top link here and the source code is available. Uh, one of the most interesting projects uh, in the last three years and something is Puda. Um, that's the goal of Puda wasn't really to create free software, it was to, uh, let me see, um, to explore how the library can get access to its own data, what protocols, what formats are available, and to explore what can be done with the data that we maybe can get access to. 
again, this was the Oslo Public Library, what would we do without them, funded by Abbe Metwickley. Um, Ferber, F-R-B-R, was part of the part of what was explored, and they got some help from a guy called Trond Olberg, Olberg at, in Trondheim, uh, who had done some research on that. Uh, they got some help from uh, three IT students to create the first mashup, and they hired me to do some coding from them too. So what was uh, came out of this was a couple of mashups, where we took data from different sources and combined them. Um, they explored Viewfind uh, as an uh, alternative uh, interface for library data. As I mentioned, they looked at ferberization of library data and they looked a little bit at uh, what we can do to turn our data into linked data or semantic web data or um, this is one of the mashups, the first mashup. Uh, I think I'll take the time to show you that one. Um, we didn't spend any time on design. This was just uh, <laughs> we explored the functionality and what we could do. And uh, the goal was really to create a finished product that we would launch for users. Uh, the idea was more to explore what was possible and uh, share the code so others could continue exploring or uh, build on what we had done. So the thought here was that uh, this was going to help people who were going to travel and they, uh, today they would go to the library and type Kjellan, Copenhagen into the catalog and what do they get back? Uh, at least in Norwegian catalogs they get a mess of things and um, the plan here was to make some kind of sense out of the mess. Uh, so it suggests uh, places. Um, and then it use, tries to use uh, the UE numbers and the subject headings in clever ways. To So the main search results are travel books. And then it's supposed show some other things on the right hand side. <laughs> it worked last night. Yeah. What it does basically is... Bad Wi-Fi. Sorry? Bad Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's blame that. <laughs> <laughs> um, what it does is collect uh, data from some other sources. Uh, it's um, The system can figure out that Copenhagen is the capital of Denmark. And then it checks some other sources and finds that the language spoken in Denmark is Danish. And then it does a search in the library catalog for uh, books that teach you Danish or English or German or whatever the language might be. And it also searches for uh, fiction, uh, short stories and uh, novels from that country and it looks for the weather at the moment uh, in the city you search for. Um, there's a couple of other things that I can't remember at the moment. Uh, so it's sort of a mashup that both combines data from external sources and data from uh, the catalog itself and it does sort of clever searches that helps the user uh, to find novels from this country which the user might not have thought about doing uh, herself. Ah, it's, it's not that important. Let's just <coughs> roll on. I have a lot of things I plan to say. Uh, another one was similar, but about music. Um, you search for uh, an artist or an album, and you get a list of hits that actually it shows you music, uh, the CDs, and the, yeah, CDs mostly, um, and it doesn't show you books about the artist, that's uh, shown in uh, a books on the side, similar to both. And it also gets information about the artist from Last FM, 
And maybe the most interesting thing was uh, using the similar artist uh, pen from Master Pen, which is on the bottom right there. Um, and the numbers uh, are based on the search in the catalog, which shows me that uh, Master Pen thinks Megadeth and Slayer is related to Metallica. And uh, my library actually has seven records by Megadeth and ten by Slayer. So it's um, trying to use the data from Last FM in a clever way. Now this was uh, the most ambitious uh, mashup we did. And <coughs> definitely the one involving the most work. Because what was done here was uh, all the records related to two Norwegian authors were exported from the catalog, New Thompson and Per Petron. That was uh, 500 records or something for Knut Thompson. Um, and sort of the background to this is if you do a search for Knut Thompson in the ILS, the OPAC, or also local big library, you get lots of strange hits and you have to uh, browse to page four or something before you actually find a book written by Knut Thompson. So part of the thing here was what would we actually like our catalog to look like? How should we um, um, be presenting uh, what Neil Thompson wrote to our users? Is some random list of 500 books a good way to do it? Or could we do it a better way? And we thought we could do it a better way. They thought. So the records were exported. Um, they were FRBRized turned into FRBR somehow. That was the guy in Trona who did that. Um, the data was also turned into linked data and stored in Triple Store, where we could query it. Um, and they created a, a sort of authorized, uh, an authorized list of Knut Thompson's works. So we wrote some 30 books or something. And we made sure we could get that list out of the system in sorted by year. So this is the uh, level here. And then we made it possible to list, if you click on one of the books, you can see this is this book is available in German and French and Norwegian and Danish. And if you want the French books, you click on <coughs> show the French versions of this book and you can see which editions are available. And we also pull in some information from Wikipedia, which is the link data version of Wikipedia. Um, and again, the most interesting thing about this wasn't really the software that was produced, but it was um, looking really, really closely at the data we had. And as librarians, we kind of like to say we have really good data, and people will, will want our really good data. Um, but they found out that in order to make this quite simple thing work, with those 500 records, uh, they had to spend 50 hours to clean up the data, because it was a mess. They have been cataloging for 20, 30 years or something, uh, digitally, and the rules have changed along the way, and practices have changed, and different people do things in different ways, and there wasn't any standard uh, there was a lot of mess. Uh, there was a good standard way to represent the original title of something that had been translated, etc. Uh, so I think that was sort of an eye opener. Uh, and um, the whole uh, process of this is documented on the website for the pro pool project uh, about the organization and the team. Um, we did something similar for a part of their collection, which is they have a um, part of the Oslo Public Library is um, they have a responsibility for uh, library materials in all kinds of languages uh, directed at immigrants and. Uh, people who don't speak Norwegian as their first language. Um, so we took that collection and we made it possible to browse 
uh, through the GUI numbers based on the linked data GUI version available at, at uh, GUI.info or something. Um, so again, this was a way to play with the data and see what was possible if we turned it into linked data, for example. Again, these are prototypes, not finished products, and there are seven different repositories of source code that's available. Um, Glittre is a much smaller project that I have worked on, as yeah, it's been mainly me. Um, the aim was to make kind of middleware uh, between Z3950 and SRU servers and anything you would want to put on top of that, like a website or a mobile app or anything. Um, and one, this one has two results. One of them is a free software uh, bunch of code that you can actually use, I hope. Um, and that uh, code uh, embodies uh, some uh, the knowledge that we, uh, or a lot of things that we found out about Norwegian sector and server servers along the way. They each do things a little differently. You can sort in different ways. It supports different parts of the sector nine fifty protocol. So we try to embody that in the code. Um, Buskeru County Library um, were the ones who initiated it. this with funding from ABM Twitter again and I did the actual coding and it's uh, I can't really show you anything other than code because it's just something that goes between other systems so that it doesn't have a user interface or anything um, the same with Nordmark to R2 RDF that's a small project for transforming mark records to our death. Um, and the transformation isn't hard coded. There's a configuration file which tells you how to map from R to our diff. So that should be possible to use for other uh, projects too. It's programmed by Ben and the website at the Postal Public Library. Um, I was a little bit uh, uncertain about mentioning this project because it's my it's a project run by my company. It's called Mobibo. Uh, it's, I'm trying to create a library interface for mobile devices, more specific, specifically <coughs> smartphones, like an iPhone and Android. Um, at the moment, it's really, really basic. It does news and pages and search. And as I said, it's my project. So far, it looks like this. And it's open source. I Source code is available. So I'm trying to sell services around that and <coughs> make the source code available. Again, I'm not selling source code, I'm selling uh, hours and knowledge. So that was um, the projects I have been able to find where uh, free software has been created in Norwegian libraries. Um, initially, I made a list of uh, the things I know about that would fit in this presentation. But I also sent an email to the Norwegian email list for librarians asking about are there any other projects that I don't know about. And there were a couple of surprises, which will come now. So now I start talking about using uh, existing uh, FLOSS software in Norwegian libraries. I'm not going to talk about Firefox and OpenOffice, LibreOffice. I'm not going to talk about Apache. Uh, I'm going to talk about the software that actually sort of sits between the library and its users, uh, the, li the software that we use to present our services to users. Uh, I couldn't talk a lot about this, but I had to make some kind of choices. And it's not really library specific. Yes, there are librarians who use uh, Firefox, but I don't know how interesting that is. Um, and I'm going to make an exception right away, which is to uh, mention the Sotero, uh, which is a Firefox plugin for reference management, an alternative to EndNote. Um, all Norwegian uh, universities and university colleges almost recommend EndNote uh, as the main reference management project or reference manager or there's another one too. But some of them uh, at least mention Sotero, which is good. Uh, this is um, 
the University College of Oslo and Akershus. Uh, they have a page about how to manage references, and they mention it there, which is good. And a lot of other universities and uh, university colleges do that too. I didn't manage to find one that actually offers a, co a course in using it. Uh, so let's, hope, let's hope there are some. And here's one of the surprises, one I had never heard about before, <coughs> by Gaion which describes itself as a web-based bibliography management software. Looks like it's from the Netherlands. Um, the Westfall University College has used that to build a bibliography of Norwegian uh, school groups, basically, from 1965 until today, <coughs> um, which looks really good. Uh, you can browse different facets of the records and uh, see their descriptions and everything. Um, I haven't looked about that one. Um, another big category is, of course, uh, CMSs, Content Management Systems. Um, these are the ones I managed to find. Drupal uh, is used by at least a couple of libraries. Joomla, 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 no <laughs> It's used by uh, the libraries in the uh, WordPress, uh, or was at least used by the Naval uh, Academy Library in Bergen. This one is hosted at WordPress.com, but they could just about as have installed it on their own server. Actually, they did, but then they decided they weren't going to use it at all. Flow is used in Bergen. Uh, they have put a lot of effort into their pages quite recently. Uh, and I think it shows. Um, there's one that isn't very well known, I think, which is called CMS Made Simple, which is used by Lilla Amir Public Library. It's also used by Bode Public Library in the town where I live. And that's because the same guy used to work in Bode, and then he moved to Lilla. <laughs> so he used the same system in both places. Um, space is, I like to think of that as the big success story of uh, free software in Norwegian libraries, or at least close to Norwegian libraries. Uh, DSpace is used for creating institutional repositories, so researchers at universities put their uh, articles into DSpace. Uh, and almost every university and university college in Norway uses it. Um, so it's a success, success story in that sense, but I'm not saying the software is necessarily terribly good in looking or anything. I didn't say that. Um, it's also kind of interesting that Bipsys, uh, which is the big uh, library system for uh, academic libraries, they sell these based services. They sell these based as, uh, as a service. Uh, they call it Brake. I don't know why they can just call it DSpace. Um, they do hosting and installations and backup and everything. So uh, most of the university colleges, at least, uh, get access to DSpace through Ipsos. This is what it looks like. It looks like this is at uh, Tailback uh, University College. Another surprise, I knew about the Open Journals system, uh, which is a system that facilitates publishing electronic journals and it can handle the review process for you. You register your reviewers and you keep track of who has read it and who has given a thumbs up and has given a thumbs down and everything. But I didn't think uh, it was used in Norway, but it was. It turned out by, for example, again, uh, the University College of Oslo and actually several others. Uh, I think most of the universities actually use it to create electronic journals. So that was uh, a good surprise. Uh, iWebKit is a framework for creating mobile web apps. That's used by the uh, University of Agder to create a small uh, web app. Um, here's another one I've forgotten about. It's called MapTiler, 
which is a system that lets you create map overlays for Google Maps and Google Earth. <coughs> uh, the public library in Bergen is using that to overlay old maps from 1885 and 1925 on modern satellite images from Google Maps. <coughs> it looks a bit like this, and you can zoom in and explore, and you can sort of see, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but you can see the modern structures <coughs> through the old maps, so you can see how the town has changed. Um, another piece of software that's used in close to libraries at least is MediaWiki, which is the software that Wikipedia runs on. What's actually used in one pro project is the Semantic MediaWiki, which is uh, a bunch of plugins for MediaWiki that gives it some additional uh, capabilities and where you can export data as RDF. That's used in a wiki of Norwegian library history. Uh, I'm lucky enough to be working on that, so it's me who has done all the work so far. We're sort of creating a beta version, which will be launched in a month or two. And then hopefully uh, people will contribute to document uh, at least the local parts of Norwegian, of Norwegian library history. And, um, Let's hope something good comes after that. Uh, this is another one that's hard to show you. Uh, so far, I've mostly talked about web based software, not a lot about Linux. And that's because I don't think Linux is used a lot in Norwegian libraries. But Oslo Public Library comes to the rescue again. They have a project where they are uh, renewing all their uh, PCs for patrons. And they're doing that with what they call semi thick clients. So they have a server somewhere running Ubuntu, and they have semi thick clients running Lubuntu. And they use something called libkey for administering it. Um, they haven't really started using that completely yet, I think. But that's software that lets you um, uh, tie logins to. Uh, library user accounts and you can say each user can only have half an hour or something. Uh, I don't know the details about it. They have written quite a lot about it so if you're interested in that check out the links. And then the last of the projects is Qua, which is my, uh, my little darling child. Um, that's sort of uh, the main that's what I really focus on in bibliotech and want to send services <coughs> to. Uh, but things are not moving very fast. Uh, but it's used in Norway, at least. Um, there are two places where it's used uh, daily. It's in full use. Uh, the biggest one is the Naval Academy in Bergen. Uh, they switched from an old Norwegian proprietary system to Goa almost exactly two years ago, I think. I don't remember the actual date, but I think it was sometime in September. They're not a terribly terribly big library. They are two librarians and uh, a few hundred students. Uh, but they're the first ones who switched to Goa. Then there is the Norsk Center for Folk Music, Folklands, which is a kind of archive for uh, Norwegian <coughs> music and dancing. They don't use it for their archive, but they have a collection of, I think, 10,000 books and uh, sheets, what do you call it, note sheets, and stuff like that, that they use for. Uh, for. Uh, the Naval Academy is a uh, customer with me, uh, but not the folk music thing they have who are running on a box somewhere on the desk, I think. <laughs> This is what it looks like. This is the OPAC of the Naval Academy. The, uh, not customized for that. <coughs> and there are quite, uh, there are at least four other places where it's uh, in the process of being implemented. There's the Waldorf education just outside of Oslo at Nesol, uh, which are just about to start using it. Uh, Buskerud County <coughs> Library, which we saw earlier. 
is using it for a collection of about 1,000 uh, movies, DVDs, that they will lend to public libraries in their area. Uh, they're just about to start using it for that. Uh, there's something called a Fitzkula. I don't know how to translate that, but I think it makes sense to Danish ears, perhaps. They're just about to start using it. And in the Tiki municipality, there's a maximum of 10 school libraries that are going to use it. A couple are just about ready to start using it now, I think. <coughs> and if everyone starts using it, that's 10 school libraries. And just a couple of days ago, I got an email from something, a school library in a place called Sydney that wanted to buy services from it, so they'll start using it sometime during the fall, I think. Uh, yeah, I'll just skip that a um, So that's what I know about uh, software being used in uh, Norwegian libraries. There might still be some I missed, but uh, at least it gives you some kind of picture of what's going on. Uh, Open data has been mentioned earlier, and I think that's a really important part of the puzzle. We need open, free, libre, open source uh, software, and we need open data. And first and foremost, we need access to our own data, our bibliographic records, and all the data we have apart from that. Um, that's been part of what the pool project did. They made available all the records that they polished and all the RDF that they made and uh, so others can build on it and play with it. Uh, there are some other... Um, let's be honest, there's one guy in Drona uh, who has been working a lot with open data. It's called Rubik van Suino. He's originally from uh, England somewhere. Uh, and he's been working on turning traditional library data, like uh, subject headings and uh, some bibliographic records, I think, turning them into linked data. Um, when I contacted him to ask about which URL I should give you to learn more about it, he, uh, being himself, as always, um, could only say that, well, we don't have a website and we really don't have a server for our data either, so uh, that's how we do it. Um, but they have used something called CTAN, which is a place where you can register your uh, open data sets. And they uh, use uh, server software from um, uh, a company in the UK called Talis. So they don't have any infrastructure of their own, they just use other people's infrastructure, which is a good idea sometimes. Um, there's medical subject headings here, uh, there's a special collection, uh, Norwegian classification of scientific disciplines, uh, personal name authorities from the BIPSIS catalog, and a vocabulary of Terms that has to do with science and technology. So at least three of them are subject headings, I think. Go have a look. Okay, then this uh, mysterious thing called upstream, um, which is me trying to talk a little bit more generally about uh, what I think about free software for libraries. Um, and what I say when I mean by upstream, it's kind of a picture where you're standing underneath the waterfall and you're getting all this uh, free software for free. And I'm trying to argue that we should remember to give something back, send something upstream, so the water keeps running down on us. <coughs> Did that make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. uh, so please take note, here comes the main point. Uh, when making changes to free Libre open source source code, submit your changes upstream. Don't just make the changes for yourself, unless it's very specific to your local systems or your local uh, environment. 
Uh, if it's something that could possibly be useful for someone else, uh, submit your changes upstream, make it available to the general project. Why should you do that? Because it's how free software moves forward. If no one ever gives anything back, there isn't any free software. <coughs> so giving something back to the community is a good thing. Um, the best thing uh, is it's not all about uh, altruism and being good to others, it's good for yourself too. If you make changes, um, you're stuck with making sure that when you upgrade to the next version of the, the main project, that your changes still work. They don't necessarily do that, someone could have changed something that affects what you did. Um, well, I just lost my train of thought. Um, I said there were two things, right? Uh, <laughs> just this speed. Yeah, that's the main thing. You don't have to re-implement again and again and again your local changes uh, because they will be part of the big whole and uh, other people will have to make sure that uh, your code still works or the things you need still work if they change the code. Um, so I think it pays off in the long run, even if you have to put in an extra effort to get it into the upstream code. Um, you can send your code to the mother project, um, but someone there can say, yeah, that's okay, but it would be even better if you did it this way or you did this too, because then it would be more generally useful. And we'll integrate it into the main code if you do that. Um, and I'd recommend doing that, because it will save you time in the long run. When you have had five major updates that you have had to adapt your local change to, then you've, then you've spent a lot more time than you could have done making sure it got in in the first place. And it's fun. Mm. Um, I have one example of this happening in Norway, where a library uses uh, a free software uh, product and they have uh, contributed something back. It's called, it's related to Kua, and it's bug number 2593. It's a feature that was suggested by someone in the US. They entered, in, entered it into the bug tracking system of Kua. And then when the Naval Academy uh, were decided that they wanted Kua, they needed to be able to register or uh, enter a lot of items at once because they then uh, uh, curriculum books to their students. So they have maybe 150 items that are identical except for the barcode. So they needed a way to just say, give me, add 150 copies uh, of this item. And that was missing from Kua. And uh, through me, we, uh, I have a partnership with a French uh, company called Bib Libre. We have a lot of Kua developers and we figured out how much it would cost. The Naval Academy said, okay, that's, uh, we're still going to save money uh, uh, switching to Kua, even if we pay for this, so we'll pay for it. And they did, and Bib Libre uh, developed it and it was submitted to the main uh, project and it was integrated into Kua version 3.2. And everyone was happy. And today, if you, whenever you enter items into Goa, you will see three uh, buttons down here, and two of them were paid for by the Naval Academy in Bergen. Uh, and I think that's kind of cool. Maybe that's just it. Um, contributions don't have to involve money necessarily. Uh, contribution can be reporting bugs, checking that a bug that someone else reported actually is a bug, answering questions on email lists and IRC, uh, writing documentation, testing improvements that have been made, testing the next major version before it's released. Um, the thing is that time is one of the most scarce resources we have, at least we who are lucky enough to live in uh, affluent parts of the world. Um, time is money. I guess. 
Um, this is one of my uh, Norwegian called it Chet Pest, the farm side. This is what I stand for, sort of. If you're paying someone, a company or a person, to do uh, open source software for you, to develop it or adapt it, um, my recommendation is that you make sure that upstream is a part of the deal you make. Uh, new developments should be available, made available to the upstream project. And even if, um, like some of the libraries that I host Goa for, I don't do any development for them, but they pay me to make sure Goa is running for them. And I think in a relationship like that, uh, giving back to the community could be part of what the library is paying for. Because small libraries <coughs> with limited resources don't have the time or they don't think they have the time to get involved with the community and uh, test bugs and things like that. So that's uh, one possibility is to pay someone like me for doing that and I'm trying to do that um, by doing minor bug fixes and improvements, testing your code. Uh, I have tried to organize something called bug scorching days where we uh, encourage people to concentrate on getting rid of bugs during one day of the month, for example, and answering questions on mail lists. And I think that's the right way to do to be an open source vendor. It's not just to take money from people and uh, provide them good services, but to be able to give something back to the uh, modern project, the upstream project. Um, but I'm also, I would also very strongly encourage any libraries using open source to be a part of the community, to engage, to read mailing lists, to hang out on IRC, go to conferences if you can afford it. Uh, because you learn new things, you make new friends, and again, it's fun. Open source is fun. Downside is, yes, it does take some time, but uh, I think it's worth it. Okay, conclusions, or maybe not. <coughs> um, one of my guiding lights in what I do and how I think about libraries and open source is this random tweet uh, someone uh, 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 relaying what someone called Bill Chavchek said at an evergreen conference in the US. To stay relevant, libraries must control the software that's at the core of their operations. I think that's just so true. If we don't have control of our software, we don't have control of what we're doing and how we're providing services to our customers or patrons or users or whatever you call it. See, I'm still switching between being a vendor and being a librarian and <laughs> saying we, we libraries. Um, um, this was inspired by the first talk this morning. Is the old way doing what we needed to do for us? Or have we been serfs long enough paying our masters to protect us from having to think about our systems and our data? It's sort of comfortable. You have one of the established old trustworthy companies and you pay them a lot of money every year and maybe they, you get some improvements for your software. And why would you want to do anything else? Um, I think we need to do something else. I think we need freedom to tinker, to play with our systems, try out new things, uh, see what works, what doesn't work, what doesn't work. Uh, we need to be able to experiment or pay someone to experiment on our behalf. Um, and I think free Libre open source software is an excellent platform for tinkering and experimenting, trying out new things because you can move fast and it. Uh, can be relatively cheap as opposed to paying someone to do it uh, in a proprietary way. So I think we need to move fast and I think we need to break some things, but if we find we still need them, we probably better put them back together again. Um, development shouldn't be something that's done on a two, three, four year scale where we have lots of committees writing documents and everything needs to happen now because uh, the world is moving really fast at the moment. Things are happening all over the place. 
I think the distributed or peer-to-peer -peer nature of freely open source software is perfect for doing that. I also think libraries need hackers. I think we need hackers that work in libraries, not just hackers that we can hire for projects. And by hackers, of course, I don't mean people who hack into the Pentagon to <laughs> find out secret things. I mean coders, uh, people who write code. And development needs to be a part of business as usual, not, not just something we do as projects. That's uh, one of the main problems we have in Norway, I think. Any kind of development is just a project that you have to apply for money and then wait for half a year before you maybe get some money and then you need to find the people to do it. And then it's been a year since you had the idea until you actually have the result. Uh, having developers in-house will be uh, much better, I think. Not every small, tiny little library should have a full-time programmer, of course, but I think we need uh, some small libraries with coders, and at least the big libraries should be leaders and have coders and be able to do things. And of course, perpetual beta is one of the slogans. Uh, not as an excuse for providing bad services, but as a reminder that we're never done. We could have what we should always be thinking about how to improve our services. Uh, new roles for libraries. I just saw a couple of tweets uh, straight after lunch that said uh, Amazon has launched its um, some kind of program where you can lend libraries can uh, lend uh, books from Amazon to people who have Kindles. I don't know the details, but um, at least in Norway, there's a bit of discussion about what should we do if uh, books in the future are digital, and there's just one national database of library books that everyone uses from their own computers. Where does that leave uh, libraries? Should we be some kind of uh, social institution for homeless people, or what should we do? Do you discuss that in Denmark too? Yeah, a few notes. Uh, one of the suggestions, which I think is good, is documenting uh, the local history and happenings uh, to being a place where uh, let me say it another way, a lot of things are getting global Amazon is global, if Amazon is going to provide our library books in the future uh, it will be uh, very general and not tied to a specific place so one of the advantages of a library can be that it's uh, local, it knows its local surroundings, it's a f uh, it can be a focal point for the local population. Uh, and one of the tasks of the library can be to document local history and things that happen locally. And uh, helping patrons do that for themselves. Uh, so librarians shouldn't necessarily be running around with video cameras, but libraries might lend video cameras uh, to their par patrons so they can document things for themselves. And sharing the stuff that's created with uh, Creative Commons licenses makes a world of sense, I think, which ties into the last talk we have, of course. And that's uh, part of that is to do with bridging the digital divide. The library could make sure that everyone has access to a video camera, to a good camera, to editing software, to places to uh, publish what's being created. And we could do that in two ways. Um, what I think we should <coughs> want to do is uh, have some powerful computers available to people. People might just have a uh, netbook with a 10 inch screen, which is less than ideal for editing video, I think. So, being able to go to the library and have a really powerful machine for editing video might be a good thing. Uh, related to that is libraries could also buy uh, powerful uh, editing software from Apple or Microsoft and make that available. 
Uh, but I think uh, using free software in that setting is makes more sense uh, related to the how libraries operate. Um, so letting uh, putting free software on our powerful machines, letting people use that in the library as a start. Then if they they think this is so much fun, they'll buy uh, a powerful computer at home. We as librarians are not telling them, well then you should buy this 2000 kroner package from Apple too. We're saying you can download the same software used here at home and use that uh, uh, when you're doing the things at home that you used to do at the library. Sort of thing. Uh, I'm just about wrapping up now. Uh, I think this is the conclusion. Yes? Finally, every, li every library conference should have a hack fest or a hack lab or whatever you call it. So that's 10 points to move uh, fast and break things. So that's, I don't know if that counts as conclusions. At least try to um, draw some lines to the earlier presentations today and uh, sum up some of my thinking about free software. So then it just remains to say thank you for your patience. And, um, as I said, I'll put the presentation on my chair, so you can follow the links if you want to. And if you want to contact me, my uh, email address is here. The purpose of this day is to talk about open software and why should we uh, move towards open software and free data. And I think uh, some of the examples that you showed us is a very good example. And that's also what we're probably going to see in half an hour when the hack lab is finished. <laughs> is if we do open source and have free data, we can move fast and break things. So I think, yeah, your the whole uh, talk was a, was a good conclusion. Thank you. I forgot to say I'm really looking forward to seeing you. <laughs> <laughs> we all are. We all are, yes. <laughs>